So this week we talked about a really personal issue to me, which is plastic surgery. And I had the fortune of meeting up with two wonderful women that had made the decision to have plastic surgery. And for them, it went well. But I'm more than aware that it doesn't always happen like this. There are people that have lost their lives as a result of plastic surgery. There are others that have jobs done that are bodge jobs and make them look like they are half human. Um, but for me, it must take a lot of guts and a lot of consideration to go under the knife. And it's not something that I've taken lightly myself. I've considered it. I've thought about the journey. I've thought about the cost. I've thought about the implications. I've thought about my life. I've thought about my desires and why I would want it. You know, back in the day, there was the box. We used to watch music videos of girls in America shaking their ass, shaking their tail feathers. And it didn't seem like it was in your face because it felt so far away. Now, your average person, your average girl is having surgery. Your friends at work have had surgery. Your girls in the club that have had surgery. And for some of us, there's a comparison. And we think, our bodies don't look like that. What can I do to make myself feel as confident as they seem, as they present with their bodies? You know, I've been on a weight struggle journey for all of my life. Those that know me in real life, you know that I'm not small. You see my videos. Um, I have been an obese child and I continue to struggle with weight. I almost have, I think, a really negative relationship with food, with weight, um, with eating, with exercise. I have, at times, body dysmorphia. I have body insecurities. I have body shame, um, body hate. There are lots of times that I don't love the skin that I'm in, but it's a journey and it's improving, but I'm not going to, as you know, on these afterthoughts, be untrue. And I will tell you exactly what my journey has been. My journey started way back when, 10 years old, my mum decided that I was an obese child. Oh no, she didn't decide it, the scales decided it, but I was an obese child. I couldn't fit into clothes your regular clothes. I used to wear adult clothes at 10 years old. I couldn't go to Croydon and shop in Tammy Girl. Those are my age. Remember, I couldn't get my clothes from there. My mum used to have to go and buy me my uniform from Alders. And I used to have to wear these granny pleated skirts with really thick heel Dr. Martins because my foot would be lean off. You know, it was so heavy and so wide. I always had to have wide fitting shoes, either from Clark's or somewhere of that nature. And I always felt like an outcast. I was always the fat girl. I was always the fat girl. I was always a fat, friendly, happy girl that used to eat people's lunches at school. You know, the skinny girls didn't want their food and I would be comfort eating and they would give me their packed lunch, their school lunches, and I would laugh and giggle and I would just be the friendly fat girl. So my mum decided she was going to take action. She was a nurse. She decided that I needed to go and see a dietitian. I needed to see someone to help me with my weight. And I never forget, every Wednesday, I used to go to a hospital called St. Thomas's Hospital, located in South London. And I used to have to go and weigh in. And I remember going into this office and feeling the shame at 10. I was in primary school, you know. But I knew what it was like to be obese and to be bullied because I was fat and be called names, you know. And I used to try and shit it out before I got on the scales I'd be in the toilet pushing but every week I'd put on weight and the doctors couldn't understand it and my mum would always say to me you know what say to them what's going on because I don't have sweets in the house I don't have anything but she didn't know that outside of the house I was eating people's lunches and the lunch money she would give me I wouldn't need to buy a lunch so I would buy sometimes two Kit Kats and two Lion Bars a day I would gorge them outside until I felt physically sick. Then I would go home. But that was because I was going into a house where there was domestic violence, where there was alcoholism, where there was mental health. And that was my escape. That was my ability to cope by eating. I'm also from a West Indian household where food was seen as love. Um, If you don't finish your food, you get criticised. If people are coming round, you've got to cook and you've got to eat. And even if you went to see your friend and ate there, you need to come home and eat your mum's food because she would criticise you for not eating that food. So food became a big deal. 
it became my mum's sometimes only way of showing that she loved someone because with mental health issues and depression she struggled to communicate her feelings sometimes and she showed my mum was known for her Guyanese cuisine she was known for her rotis and her curries and her chow mein. that's what she was known for and every weekend she would put on spreads people would come to her house every Sunday and Camilla would eat and I would eat and eat and eat so much so that my dietitian got in touch with London Tonight, Alistair Stewart. I was on there and I remember they came and they watched me. I was in an adult class gym in South Norwood Leisure Centre and they watched me ride my bike down the road. I had on like an adult sized tracksuit because I couldn't fit in kids tracksuits. Um, burgundy one, never forget it. And I was really embarrassed because it was filmed and my mum taped it on a VHS and I would have to go to school on the Monday. And my friend, I have a really good friend at the moment who is still like my really close primary school best friend. She's like my family. And she remembers me having to deal with the aftermath and feeling quite embarrassed about being on telly for being overweight. But we were the two big girls in school. So I always had a partner in crime, you know. But once you leave primary school, people get mean. People get harsh. People get horrible. People don't care about people's feelings. And I don't think they do now. West Indians don't care. You go to the Caribbean, yo, fat girl, big girl, big ties, big. And at that time, it wasn't seen sexually. It was actually just your fat. And that was it. I used to feel uncomfortable. My legs used to rub together. I used to have to put powder between my legs. It was, it was awful growing up as a bigger girl. I grew up in the Caribbean. I left England when I was 11, 11 and a half. And I went to my parents' home, Guyana, and there I was criticised for being a big girl too. So weight has always been something that I really struggled with. Um, I remember taking, at one point, five Imodiums because I was convinced that having diarrhoea would help me to lose weight. Some would say that's anorexia or bulimia. I was about 15 at the time. And I remember being hospitalized because I had accidentally overdosed. I had a stomach ache, but I was like, yeah, this is good, you know. But I took too many. So I didn't intentionally commit self-harm. But I was actively thinking, oh, this would be a good thing. Um, the tablets had to be removed from my body. I ended up being rushed to the hospital. But all I kept thinking of was how much weight I potentially could have lost. That was a, a pivotal moment for me that I realised no matter what I did, I couldn't lose this weight. I was on the cricket team, the basketball team. I was um, on the trials for the Commonwealth Games. I think that was like 2007. I was a power forward. I was active, but I was still big. The guys wouldn't pick me because I was still big. Not only was I big, but I was dark, you know, like the double whammy. And I always wondered what it would be like to have my belly sucked out. And I think that's when my first images of plastic surgery came into my head as a teenager. But it wasn't accessible then because only celebrities had it at that time, you know. So, you know, fast forward to now being a younger woman, I was, you know, confident. And I decided to embrace my size. I met a few guys. and But every heartbreak, there was always that wonder that did he dump me because I was fat? Did he dump me because I've got a belly? Did he dump me because my face isn't, you know, snatched like the rest of them? And I think it was probably later in my 20s that I really considered having surgery. I wanted... You know, as I was growing up and losing weight and dropping weight and putting on weight and losing weight, my breasts grew and they shrunk, then they grew, then they shrunk. So gravity has played its toll. And no, they're not perky anymore. And even now in intimate relationships, it, it, it's a it's a breath holding moment when <laughs> you've got to lie down and oh my God, you've got to take off the bra. Oh shit. Ugh. 
like let's try and get a position a little like let's can we go on the side can I go on the side you know because it looks better on the side didn't it when my and the breasts are like squeezed between my two hands but the reality is I want to just take off my bra and even though I'm a bigger girl I would want my longer breasts not to be the focus of your eyes but I also wouldn't want my stomach to be the focus of my eye your eyes I can't even say that it was my daughter's fault because as I said I've been a big girl for a long time so right now I tread between a 16 18 depending on the the lycra and that's how I have to buy clothes I look at the percentage of lycra in the clothes. Anything over 5% lycra is good for me. And I know skinny girls have their own issues that they feel they don't feel clothes, but that's a big deal. You know, before when I was growing up, I couldn't buy clothes from Topshop even as a teenager because they didn't make clothes my size. Even now, I struggle with Zara. I can't buy trousers from Zara. Any European style clothes, I can't. Thank God for the fashion overs. And the pretty little things that have made fashion accessible. And granted, they get criticised because they say that they're encouraging obesity because they go up to three extra large and four extra large. But sometimes it's not so easy to lose this weight. I've done everything. So I've been on Weight Watchers, Slimming World, Lighter Life, Cambridge, I've got my fitness pal. I've had personal trainers. So I've been virgin. I've been fit, uh, fitness first. I've been recreation center. I've done it all. I've run. I've done 5K to couch or couch to 5K. I've, you know, I've tried. Consistency isn't great because after three months and I'm not seeing that I'm not down to a size 12, I'm not happy. And I say, fuck it, I'm done. But that's not going to get me the waist that I want. And I appreciate that. But sometimes when you've been on this journey for so long, it is so hard to get there. When you don't have a partner that's with you, motivating you and running with you, sometimes it's hard to just do it on your own. When you've got a child and you've got no childcare and you're told, oh, just do a routine in the living room. It's not that easy. So, yeah, I've thought about plastic surgery. I really have. I've thought about it a lot. I've weighed up the costs. And, you know, in our community, black culture now, as I said, and we've looked at the interviews, it's become more acceptable. And something even that we may flaunt where we never used to. There's things that I have to consider. I like where to do it. And I know the girls, one of the girls on our podcast, she went to Turkey. And at first people were like, oh, no, you might get a bodge drop. But people are risking it. Like... <laughs> I, you know, you're going to a country that no one speaks your language and you are lying down on a table where sometimes you have no one with you and you are trusting that this person that doesn't speak English is going to make your body into the way that you hope it should be. That's dangerous, but it's also necessary for you to feel maybe good about yourself. You don't get to go to Turkey before and have a look at the facility as you would here. Because they say, you know, these are the things you need to consider. Look at who's going to do the surgery. Do your research. Go and see. Have realistic expectations. Have a, a goal that's correct. Um, just know exactly that you can't do maybe everything that you want to do at one time. What's your priority? So if I had a priority now, my priority would be my breasts, my stomach, my back fat. I just want a mummy makeover. And if you don't know what a mummy makeover, it's really taking the parts that have been impacted by pregnancy um, and fixing them. So your breast, your belly, your back fat, your, yeah, about that area. They're necessary things, not only when you're a mum, but just say you, you just don't like your body. So they're the areas that women often don't like. But if you go to Turkey, you don't get to check out surgery. So you're going. You go on your, your timing. You say, okay, there's no point doing it when I'm going to have a baby. But what if you've got, had no children now? If I had no children, I'll be waiting to have children before I had breast implants. Because I just think, what's the point? Because they're going to suck the life out of them, right? But sometimes this baby's not guaranteed. The men ain't bloody guaranteed. So you wait and you wait and you wait. And then you think, I'm getting too old, might as well do it. 
So, you know, nursing changes your bodies completely. And you think, oh my gosh, what shall I do? Should I do it? Should I not do it? You have to save for it as well. I am a really big advocate for education. And I think to myself, I would feel so guilty spending £10,000 to fix my body when I could be spending that on my child and her education, some extra lessons or something like that. But then if I'm not happy, maybe I'm not being the best parent to her. And maybe one of my problems, which I've noticed in life, is that I never put myself first. I never do. I put my man and my child always, or my whatever, I ain't got man, but you know, put them before me. And that hurts. Sometimes you just want to be prioritized. Sometimes you just want to be number one. You just want to wake up, jump out that bed and put on your knickers and think, oh, that sauce is dripping today. Some would say, go gym, go gym. Some of the fat that we have on our body, no amount of gym. Well, yes, maybe years of gym. But who's got that time when you can actually go and get it done in a couple hours? That's the problem. To have these body transformations that people are sitting on their couch saying, oh, why don't you go gym? It takes years. And even when it takes years, some people have gastric bypasses. They have all these things to help them get there. So there's some sort of surgery involved. And I ask you, why is Botox okay? But why is, I don't know, rhinoplasty not? Why is doing your nose something that's in the forefront of your head not not okay? Because after it makes you feel good. I mean, I don't want to do my nose. I've got a black nose. It is what it is, isn't it? I don't want to change that feature. But the money is a lot. And I've looked. I follow a lot of plastic surgeons on um, my Instagram. I don't know if you know that, but I do. Dr. Miami, all sorts. I follow about 10 plastic surgeons and I have done so for years. And I have saved posts of what the body that I would like to look at. I know some people are probably listening and thinking that I'm insecure. Am I insecure if I want better looking tits? I don't think so. Am I insecure that when I put on a white dress, because these bloody white parties, I'm not going to lie, they look good on my complexion, but they don't look good on my gut. My gut does not appreciate all white dances. So can you guys stop having all white parties (laughs) until I get my surgery? Because if you've got a little pooch, a little pouch, a little cellulite, all white does not cut it so i'm saving you know i got a little monzo account plastic surgery fund but i'm scared because as i said when i started some people die and i wonder how my baby would feel knowing that her mum died for some breasts or for a bum you know like and, and, and also as a Christian, as a religious person, this is the body that God gave me. Why am I not just glad in it? Why do I not just say, if he wanted me to have this, that and that, he would have, he would have done it. But then I think to myself, God don't help those that don't help themselves. So let me go. Let me go and help myself. God will give me the means to go and do it. And it's not his fault that I ate all the pies. God probably gave me a beautiful body to start with, but it was me that filled it with shit. There is a lot of risk and you have to think to yourself, what are you weighing up? Then there's a time of work. If you're an agency staff, you're taking time off work to go and do this. So you're losing money. If um, you've got annual leave, you can take that. But the recovery, it can take weeks and months for your skin to adapt to a new shape. And you've got to do lots of massages and all sorts of things. The afters. People don't think about the after costs. There's a lot of after treatment. You need like the waist trainers. Some of the, I follow some other people on Instagram who wear like these after surgery garments. And some of them are like $500 for a one piece or something. You have to think, can you afford all of that? It's like getting a house. So I might be able to afford the mortgage. But can I afford the repairs should something happen? And that's how you have to look at it. You might be able to afford the surgery, but can you afford what it takes after? And what if you don't like it? Are you going to go back? You have to think ahead. You have to think of all of these things when you're doing it. And 
I mean, gone are the days when I'm worried about what people will think about me or what people will say, um, how people will judge me. Um, and if I've got discontentment with my body. And I will be honest to say that, yes, I do. And I'm not saying that I won't some days look at myself and think, oh, you are rocking it. But the grand scale of things, I really enjoy my body in clothes. But I don't so enjoy it out of clothes. And some might say, oh, you know, it's because you've not had someone that you've been with that has loved your body. And I can then say, you're right. Because I don't know how many men that are in relationships with women actively help us to love our bodies. Actively remind us in our naked, unmade up, uncontoured states that we are wonderful, beautiful beings in all forms. And there's no point doing that if you're also on Instagram following every other Instagram hoe because what you say out of your mouth is contradicted by your actions. So walk it like you talk it. If you really appreciate all of this, why are you lusting over girls that have had all of this surgery? That's a contradiction in itself. So if you are a man out there, know that, you know, we do rely on you. We do need you to boost us. We do. The same way that when you can't get a job or the police are after you, we boost you, we motivate you and tell you that you are wonderful kings, that you are amazing beings, that you are great and fantastic and wonderfully made. We need to be told the same. Sometimes men think that we have this overwhelming weight that we carry and we can carry it because our shoulders are broad. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we're just tired. Sometimes we just want to be held. And that's where I am. I want to be held. So it would be lovely to meet a man to do so, but I'm also going to work on trying to do it myself. I haven't decided whether I'm going to, you know, have surgery. Some people say it's a role of the plastic surgeon to facilitate the physical change to allow you to love your body to a state of normality. Because some people see their appearance as a hindrance to the person that they wish to be. I know who I am inside and I want the beauty inside to just be as represented outside as I feel it should be. It doesn't mean that I don't love myself because I think myself is inside and what I may be fixing is just the bit that you see. Will I ever have 10 grand and think, oh, well, I should actually go and buy some stocks and shares or, you know, I think I've said this before. Um, I've been in a relationship where my partner at the time, he asked me in the daylight to stand or in the light to stand in the mirror and look at myself naked. And he asked me to see all that he can see that he admires. And I felt really uncomfortable doing it because I couldn't see what he saw. I couldn't fall in love with what he had potentially fallen in love with. And it was really important for me to take that moment and to say every day I actually do need to stand in this mirror and I do need to fall in love with this skin, the lumps, the bumps. It doesn't mean that I have to accept it because acceptance for me is different to falling in love with it maybe I should accept it but then that means that I should never want to consider plastic surgery and I should never want to go on another diet I don't know I think it's such a thin complicated line between acceptance self-love self-loathing self-deprivating you know what the word is thoughts it's such a huge area and I can't tell you what the next few years hold for me and no I'm not waiting on a knight in shining armor to give me that love for my body but my point was that it helps 
So as we just go forward in our lives, I want us to go forward without judgment. I want us to go forward without looking at others that make this decision to have surgery with such disdain because you don't know the journey that they've struggled. You don't know the journey that they've traveled to get to where they are and make that decision. And I'm sure it wasn't a decision that was made lightly. So before you judge and condemn and think that people should do it better or differently, think like myself, I am 38. My first experience of obesity was at eight. I've had 30 years of struggling with this area. Isn't it time for me just to get a break? Again, I thank you for listening to my afterthought and please look out for my next podcast, which is going to be my year's wrap up where we talk about everything 2020. Take care, love one another.